As I uh, said earlier, uh, we, this is the second in three sessions today. Three more will follow on Friday and three more uh, in, on Saturday. It's all in your program, but I urge you not to miss the film which uh, is, is, will be screened in this room on Saturday at five o'clock. The film, The Price of Everything, is, uh, will be the first screening uh, in the region, and it has only recently been re uh, released in the United States. Uh, it's uh, directed by Nathaniel Khan and uh, co-produced with uh, Jennifer Stockman, who will be here to answer questions and discuss the, discuss the film with Laili. Right. This second session title is The Challenges of Data Collecting and How the Circulation of Art Impacts Art Valuation and Acquisitions. And we have just the right people for you. Uh, the first speaker is Roxanne Zand. And I'm going to give a brief on her background. Roxanne began a career in museums and art administration after three years in the UNESCO and after studying at both Harvard and Oxford. She left Iran after the revolution to resume professional activities in London in the field of education and the arts, and as one of the founding members of the Harvard Club of London. Ms. Zand was uh, the officer, an officer of the Iran Heritage Foundation before working with Asia House, as well as a freelance uh, consultant to numerous projects for the British Museum and other museums before joining Sotheby's in 2006, where she is now the deputy chair of the Middle East uh, Department. Currently, she sits on the advisory of the Pictet uh, Art Prize, the Development Board of the University of the Arts in London, and has been appointed as Deputy Lieutenant for the Greater London for her services for Middle Eastern art and culture. She is also the art editor for Encyclopedia Islamica. At Sotheby's, she has played an instrumental role in developing and contributing to the sales of Arab and Iranian art and has conducted a number of charity auctions to benefit uh, Middle Eastern art. The second speaker is uh, a dear colleague and old friend, Marjorie Schwarzer, who is a professor and administrative director of the graduate program in museum studies at the University of San Francisco. An award-winning educator and author, she has 30 plus years of experience leading innovative museum initiatives. She has published over 50 articles and reviews in museum publications and journals, including museums and social issues, museums now, the curator, and curator. Her book, Riches, Rivals, and Radicals, 100 Years of Museums in the America, was the basis for a PBS television documentary and is currently being revised for its third editions. Congratulations. In October 2018, she received the Lifetime Achievements Award in Museum Leadership from the Western Museum Association. Our third speaker is uh, Hala Khayat, who I'm sure known to everyone here, is the head of the sales at Christie's Modern and Contemporary Middle Eastern Art Department in Dubai. She has a BA in Fine Arts and Visual Communications from the University of Damascus and an MA in Design Studies from Central St. Martin College of Art and Design in London. She has held a variety of roles in the world of art and journalism, including working as an art consultant for galleries in Damascus before joining Christie's in 2007. Prior to that, she also focused on research and documentation of Middle Eastern art, a passion and commitment she still holds until today. Bringing years of experience with her, Hala is a regular speaker on the history of Arab art and the Middle Eastern art market. So help me welcome all three, starting with uh, Roxanne, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Salwa. And first and foremost, thank you so much to the organizers of this wonderful fair, to Diala Naseba and her team, 
for the generous invitation to participate today. I feel very thrilled and privileged to be here. Um, I'm just going to familiarize myself with... Right, yes, okay. Um, data, I think, you know, when I was told to talk about data collecting, I found it a fascinating subject because data in today's world is one of those words that has um, different kinds of connotations. We think of it as a master of our destinies. You know, it's going to become, we're going to be manipulated by AI, but it also um, means that, you know, we can be the overlords and uh, data and the way we use it can serve us. So it's actually a fascinating topic to think about in terms of the art market, because in fact the art market is fairly unregulated, I'm being honest, and data can have all sorts of meanings and connotations. My esteemed colleague Hala is going to later talk about how data is used in a different way than the way I'm going to be talking about. And I hope that the two of these talks together will form an interesting picture for you. And of course, I myself, I'm really looking forward to hearing the institutional side of it. Um, for most of us, when we hear data, we think of it as a buzz concept at the moment. Uh, and it has many different kinds of uh, facets to it. Four words, five words in a sense, come to mind. Accuracy, regulation, privacy, and manipulation, I think, I, I think, I mean, do raise hands if I've missed something, but I think those are the words that generally spring to mind. And of course, as we've just said, it can be both positive and negative. And before we wade into territory like Cambridge Analytica, how do we use this data? How do we harvest it? It's actually important to remember that in today's world, every single commercial enterprise is using data, harvesting data, and manipulating it to form certain ideas about what their consumer wants. So it's something we live with on a daily basis. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we do it at Sotheby's. And I have to use Sotheby's, obviously, as a case study because that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, in a uh, recent World Economic Forum newsletter, um, it was mentioned that data analysis is going to become the career of the future. How we, as I've said, harvest it and how we use it, how we understand it. And I'm not going to go into the definition of it because that's going to be too time consuming and beyond the scope. But in terms of the art industry, one key challenge for us, and I think elsewhere as well, is that data sharing is an issue. No one has access to all the data all the time. Uh, so at any given time, we're only seeing a partial picture. And as you can imagine, we always say, for example, within any business, any database is only as good as the people who manage it or put it together. So if you can imagine, there is really a lot to be desired in terms of the kind of full picture that we expect from data. And of course, if data is incomplete or somehow skewed, it can be considered disinformation. So I'm not talking about fake news, but <laughs> it can be misleading. So if we want a true picture, um, it really can be sometimes difficult. Added to which, in the art world, we have two different layers, as I'm sure you all know. We have the primary market and we have the secondary market. Within the primary market, dealers and gallerists are not under obligation to share their data and when I say data here, I mean sales figures and numbers of uh, volumes sold and so on and so forth. So it's very difficult to know exactly what has happened. In the auction houses, particularly Sotheby's because it's a public company, there is more transparency uh, because of certain, because of the way the auction trade works. But that said, even then, auction houses conduct private sales and we're not necessarily, in fact, we're not at all transparent about private sales. So to look at um, how, you know, I have a very generic chart. I've got a few slides of generic um, things that I want to talk to you about. Look at these four areas. When we deal in the auction trade, when we uh, look at how we conduct our business, these are the four areas 
that we are essentially addressing. First slice of the pie. I'm sorry, if I hope I can be heard. First slice of the pie. Who is the client? We need to identify clients. We try to make lists. We try to enumerate how many clients we have in a particular category. What do they collect? What do they like? So we put together profiles about what, you know, for example, Mr. X will have brought, bought three Tanavali paintings, and that already gives us some information. Are there things which might suit them which they haven't considered? So that's very important to know, you know, how else can we cater to the tastes? And even that requires data, believe it or not. We look at, for example, how they may have transacted elsewhere, uh, how we have seen, you know, have they bid or underbid something. Then we look at what stage are they at their, in their life by looking at whether they're young or older. It gives us some idea of the kinds of art they might be interested in, what are their goals, how do we enable our clients to achieve their goals. And again, although you may not think it, you and certainly in the olden days this was more of an art than a science, it is becoming more and more scientific because we base all of this information on data that we collect through various channels. Um, and none of them illegitimate, I, trust me. Um, then we record this information internally on our customer relationship management service. And that is, I would say, fairly typical of um, all the other auction houses. This way, we create personal, bespoke strategies for each client. So the strategy for managing our clients, very much like private banks, is based on data that we gather and collect about them. Transactions. So looking at this slice, at bidders, buyers, and sellers are recorded, as you can imagine. In the auction world, this is fairly easily done. We have, as I'm sure if anybody's been to an auction, you will see somebody standing. Uh, who is recording, as well as our computerized uh, way of recording. The auctioneer keeps a book. And we have, of course, these days an online bidding mechanism as well, which means that all of these uh, ways of transacting can be tracked. And we then look at, for example, are German clients buying more old masters or less contemporary? And in this case, in our case, of course, we look at to see I don't know whether more international buyers are taking an interest in the Middle East market. Now, I have to say something about this. With bidding, a lot of the bidding, um, how, the underbidding, the direct underbidding and the direct sales figure is readily and easily recorded. But sometimes bids at the lower end are missed. And that in itself is data that becomes incomplete. So if somebody has bid at the you know, lower level or a low estimate and then something climbs up and is sold expensively, we have missed somebody who's shown an interest at a low level. Um, a global mobile client base needs a global mobile way to transact. So we're seeing more and more activity from clients online. And I'm sure you're aware that there are increasing numbers of online sales that the auction houses are offering. In fact, we are doing certain things completely online. We can do valuations entirely online, remotely. So if good pictures are taken, sizes and dimensions and a condition are given to us, we can form valuations online. Now, you would think, Pretty innocent, yes? We send a picture, uh, evaluation is done. That's all data. So we're collecting that data. Um, again, as I'm saying, you know, before you, you have thoughts in your head about, oh my goodness, you know, is this right, wrong? What are the ethics of this? Every single commerce, pretty much, is doing that nowadays. Your data is recorded, and the word privacy may probably be removed from the English dictionary at some time soon. Market performance. So we measure and track Sotheby's performance to ensure accuracy of estimates and inform pricing decisions. We also have, I have to say, again, this may look pretty straightforward to you, but in fact, it's not. In the sense that if we want to look at participation in a market, we're looking to see what are the figures, how many people, how many, let's say, Middle Eastern clients are buying contemporary art, or how many international buyers are buying Middle Eastern art? Think about it. 
establishing true country connection is a very complex and difficult matter. I myself was born in Iran, raised in the UK, British nationality, identify actually culturally sometimes with American, with my American education. So, you know, if I'm a buyer, I might actually want to buy American art or I might take an interest in Scottish colorists, but am I a Middle Eastern client um, just because I was born in Iran? Uh, so if you think about the global uh, state that we all live in, identifying clients as being Middle Eastern clients or international clients in itself is quite a difficult and complicated way. And if we're looking at accurate data, so I'm coming back to the point of data, in terms of you know, what are the levels of Middle Eastern clients transacting in certain markets, what are Middle East participations in Middle Eastern art as opposed to international buyers, that's still a very complicated calculation to make in the true sense of the word. So we also use a number of third-party data sources to track market activity. Again, I have to say no one third-party data source tracks all transactions although some are close to comprehensive, but nobody has access to all the data. This is, uh, and I might refer later to blockchain, but this issue is a fairly hot one at the moment, as you can imagine. We can also take into account other external data, for example, stock market performance. Now, I have to say, both big auction houses, and I'm sure the smaller ones as well, actively discourage their clients from uh, thinking uh, about art as a speculative asset class, about flipping artwork and so on. But truth be told, we do look at the stock market to see, you know, could there be a pending, an impending crash? Could there be an issue? Sometimes the art market can be connected to the stock market and sometimes not. But we combine all of this type of data and we do have business intelligence offices within auction houses where all this type of data is looked at and uh, sort of projected into a model for looking at future market movements and even thinking about price adjustments. Now, I know that we have a short time. We each have only about, I think, 12 to 15 minutes, and I'm going to be very quick. Um, but I wanted to say that the next thing that we should all be looking at is really the future. And the future is all about digital, the digital world. This can be quite uh, exciting, but remember that things like mobile apps, Apple TV, all of this, there is a generational issue involved. I mean, I, very few of our older clients are on mobile apps or Apple TV. Uh, we know how many visitors are when you're going online, when you're using online sources for data collecting, we know exactly what the footprint is, how many visitors have been, what lots they're going for, we gauge the level of interest, so it all becomes much more, uh, we're able to marshal it in a much better, uh, easier way. We also track social media interest and respond quickly to changes in trends, um, and clients can set reminders for auctions or certain lots, and we personalize communications depending on their interest levels. Lastly, um, as my parting word, just to say that we are in the middle, Sotheby's is in the middle of a multi-year investment in digital infrastructure. And as I've mentioned, although um, you know, I've remained firmly in the realm of figures and data that relates to actual hard uh, statistics and hard figures for the art world. Um, for in the future, we are going to see all digital auctions, even though you can use your paddle, but that will of course mean that our world will become even more data-driven than before. We're expanding our customer management to better focus on client needs, which of course means, like Amazon or eBay, we'll be able to be more attuned, more immediately responsive to what the clients want through the intelligence that we know about their previous activities. We are incorporating more sources of third-party data. So as you can imagine, you know, with third-party data, I, I'm sure you all know because the audience here is um, a well-informed one, you know, Art Tactic, Art Net, these are all places that we get our information, Art News, um, 
uh, Art News Magazine online, Art Prize, Invaluable, Blue In, all of these sources can help us form uh, sort of better and better pictures in terms of statistics. Sotheby's has also bought the May Moses Index. I don't know if you know about that. Uh, the indices, uh, the May Moses Indices are put together. Uh, now, it, May Moses has 45,000 objects in eight different co collecting categories, tracks the performance of these, and feeds back information. Now, you know, we, we still continue to think of the uh, auction trade as an art and not a complete science, but all of these things are giving better and better information of how to look at, how to interpret data, really. Um, and, of course, we're employing machine learning. That's a whole different subject, and I would be very happy, because I'm aware that I'm running out of time, I'd be very happy to answer any questions afterwards about machine learning. Uh, and we are an... We have announced that we are exploring the applications of blockchain. So uh, all of that is going to be a very, very interesting future in terms of managing, gathering, applying, and interpreting data in the art market. And as I said, if you have further questions, please remember to uh, address them afterwards at question time. Thank you very much. That was so fascinating, Roxanne. Um, oop, clicker. Okay, so I'm actually going to begin with a contest, and I have prize. These are two persimmons that I picked from my tree in San Francisco yesterday. And if the first person who answers the question wins the persimmons. What is the average amount of time a typical adult art museum visitor spends in front of one work of art, including reading the label? Ten. Okay, keep that fact in the back of your mind as I talk about public art museums and standard collections management policies. So, whoop, 10 seconds, here we go. Okay, that slide looks familiar, doesn't it? Bruce showed the same slide uh, just a few minutes ago. So public art museums collections acquisition practices have evolved considerably. Gone are the days when museums were so starved for art that they accepted everything that came their way and put it all on display. Today, because of changed standards in design, education and collections management practices most museums exhibit, only three to five percent of their collection at any one time. Additional work might be displayed as thumbnails on a website, but most sits deep, deep in storage, wrapped in archival materials, hung on racks, numbered, or in the case of much of contemporary artwork that uses unusual or corrosive material disassembled with each component separately accounted for. The cost of storage, climate control, and conservation is growing while space is more and more limited. Internal practices have changed because museums recognize that they need to be outward-looking public institutions that are not owners of treasures, but custodians of community, intellectual, and aesthetic assets. Museums have broad accountability, not just to our collections, but to our audiences, professional staff, and future generations of audience and professional staff. 
Thus, it shouldn't come as a surprise that museums take the process of adding objects to permanent collections very seriously. Especially within the contemporary art world, many highly invested stakeholders Artists, scholars, collectors, dealers have strong opinions about how a museum should build and curate its collections. To protect long-term integrity in the face of so many demands, the museum field has worked hard to develop ethical codes and professional standards. Two sources inform every accredited museum in the United States the American Alliance of Museums National Standards and Best Practices positions a museum's collection management practices within its larger institutional framework. Museum registration methods, affectionately known as REG, at over 500 pages, provides the details on properly building and managing a collection in support of a public service mission. This manual synthesizes expertise from hundreds of professionals on an array of practices. The goal is to minimize risk to both the collection and the institution. Both sources emphasize that a museum must adopt and follow a collections policy. Yes, it sounds bureaucratic, but for museums, a written policy approved and periodically reviewed and amended at the very top level of the organization guides the prudent development of the collection. Most collections policies are mercifully short, only about 15 double-spaced pages, but they are also very specific, especially in regard to, oops, ah, yeah, acquisitions, accessions, and what we in the museum world call de-accessions that is removing an object from a collection. Acquisitions. In the museum world, a professional curator drives acquisitions by using her professional judgment to research, identify, and propose to quote the New York Metropolitan Museum of Arts collection policy, quote, exceptional works of art for acquisition to the collection that further the stated mission. To help identify and acquire available work, whether through purchase, commission, gift, promised gift, or loan from another public or private collection, it is also the curator's job to develop relationships with philanthropists, collectors, galleries, dealers, and artists. Policies that adhere to museum professional standards state in firm legalistic language that a curator or other museum staff member cannot benefit privately from these relationships. To quote the Met again, an employee who learns of an art object available for purchase that is reasonably likely to be of interest to the museum is expected to place the interests of the museum ahead of his or her own. Policies, at least in writing, tightly control not only their employees' interactions with the marketplace, but also the amount of money a curator is allowed to spend or bid at any one time. That amount is shockingly low, less than some of the price tags of artwork on sale right here at this art fair. So what happens if a curator identifies a highly desirable work that is priced over the allowable amount that she judges worthy of acquisition? 
By the time she jumps through the necessary hoops for an exception to policy, the work will probably have sold privately. Even the most heavily endowed museums have tight acquisition budgets and lengthy approval processes, which is one reason why museums rely so heavily on gifts and loans from individuals rather than purchases. Most policies give the museum a reason to reject an artwork, even a well-intentioned or politically advantageous gift, for reasons like no space, prohibitive cost of care, lack of legal documentation, or lack of fit with the mission. Once a work is acquired in order, ah, once a work is acquired, in order to become part of the permanent collection, it goes through a formal accessioning process. A committee, usually made up of the director, curatorial team, and selected trustees, vets it according to criteria in the policy. First, the curator explains how the work aligns with the museum's mission and how the work is useful for exhibitions, research, and education. As we will hear in many of this week's talks, documentation of provenance and, authentic and authenticity is essential. Additional information to help future curators is also needed, including the artist's biography. If the artist is still alive, it is common to take an oral history and it is essential to note obligations to the artist in terms of copyright, digital access, installation instructions, care, or preservation. At this point, the museum assesses its ability to meet those terms as well, or in the case, oops, In the case of a gift, the stipulations a donor might make. The museum also assesses its ability to care for the work. Care of some contemporary art can be especially challenging as artists continue to experiment with corrosive and organic material, mixed media, technology, and concepts like participation, decay, and erosion. A donor's ego can be even more erosive. I know of more than one museum where a donor has gifted a painting and stipulated that it never be hung, not ever, and that it never be stored, not ever, next to a painting by the same artist donated by a rival collector. Once approved for accession, a registrar processes the object and assigns it a unique number. For the sake of consistency, collections policies actually spell out the exact numbering procedure. Speaking of numbers, and without going into the details, of 13 single-spaced pages of financial accounting standards, boards, rules related to public arts, uh, public museums, art collections, here's a fact that may surprise a few of you. Once a work is accessioned into a public museum, it is no longer a financial asset. It is no longer a commodity with value in the larger marketplace. So what happens when a museum decides to deaccession or get rid of an artwork? To quote the Getty, disposal of works from the collection through sale exchange or other means is solely for the advancement of the museum's mission. This cycle of, this process of recycling the proceeds from the sale of deaccession artwork 
back into the museum's collection ensures, as Bruce Altshuler said in the panel before this, that museums operate not as short-term holding places, but as public institutions beholden to a greater mission. In closing, the policies for acquiring, accessioning, and deaccessioning art may sound like they are counter to the spirit of the contemporary art marketplace. They are. In the words of the Whitney Museum of American Arts policy, the policy is there to protect the collection, the board, and the staff from personal, professional, and political pressures. And perhaps even more importantly, to ensure maintenance of internal communication, accountability, and continuity between current and future staff members. So this is all a good thing, I think, but a larger question looms. How can we justify the time-consuming processes and costs of building and maintaining art collections in the public realm when only three to five percent is on display at any one time and when the average amount of time that a visitor spends in front of a work of art, and that includes reading the label, is only 10 seconds. Art critic Georgina Adam implores us to remember that there is more than meets the eye when we talk about the business of art collecting, art collecting and the controlled flow of contemporary art into museums. She wants us to remember, quote, the millions of people who go to shows, the art lovers who join museums and enjoy them. And frankly, in my opinion, that is the most important data in regard to art collections these days. Who visits museums? Why do they come? What do they get out of their experience? And what can we do to get people, everyone, to look more closely at art and to become living partners with the back of house policies that exist to keep museums sound, healthy, and in the public domain? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Salua and Dr. Nada for organizing the amazing program of the talks. Uh, Roxanne and Professor Marjorie, it was very nice and very interesting to hear you speak. Uh, I don't, uh, I'm glad that I'm speaking about something else from the, uh, wearing the auction hat. Uh, but just going back a little bit to what Roxanne finished with the blockchain, I heard uh, a few weeks ago that Christie's was the first auction house to embrace this technology, and they actually teamed up with Artery, a blockchain company, for the very first time last night in New York for the very big uh, Barney Epsworth uh, American Modernism co uh, collection, uh, where the very famous uh, Hooper painting sold for 91 million. And it seems that this is the only, the first auction that is now forever traceable on blockchain. I still don't know and don't understand at all this technology, but it's happening. So hopefully, in the Arab and Iranian market will benefit from this maybe in our, in our lifetime. Um, so the title is very big, and uh, I can't see it, so I don't know. I think I'll just do this, because I don't have my computer. Um, so basically, uh, I'm gonna just skip a little bit and start with the fact that as a Middle Eastern art specialist, when I receive a work of art, it's not at all the same experience when a Western art specialist receives a work of art. I mean, maybe not for contemporary pieces, but we're talking about the modernism. So um, as you can, I mean, as everybody probably in the room know, because uh, to be here at four, you're all the people in the know. Um, art moves and changes hands from the artist studio to the private museums, to the public museums, to private collections. And I think the title is like little for me to read, so I'm gonna try to, 
I'll, I'll just read from it, it's better. So basically, from art studio, straighted, gifted, inherited, bought, resold by dealers, collectors, friends, family, estate. It's exhibited in galleries, art fairs. People take pictures along the way. People send things on WhatsApp. People send things on you know, Instagram. And it's everywhere. Everybody seems today to be knowledgeable about art. But then we, we really take this moving very seriously. And we try to track every little piece of information because it comes back to us, it haunts us after years. So at Christie's, and without going very much into the technological details and the digital world, over the last 12 years, they've changed so many platforms, and every year uh, I have a new training to access new, new um, you know, uh, programs, but to list a few of them that we currently use and we are always, uh, you know, we have to be really uh, prof uh, professional using them. It's JDE, something called Object Finder, something called Lot Finder. We have something called James for James Christie's, Christie's Maps, M Media Library. And basically all these like different platforms are used and, uh, by many people in the company across many channels feeding information. From the minute a work is, uh, arrives to the warehouse to the minute a contract is you know, sent to a client, to the minute it's photographed, and then these images will be used, you know, maybe in the press, people will uh, ask for them, you know, in books, in publication. We all have uh, specific tools to use them. So that's on the digital world. Um, because we've been around a very long time, uh, 252 years, um, we, there are many groups at Christie's who are always working on namely with museums and for the loans purposes, to go back to the archives, to go back to all the data that we have and, and trace back works that were sold in 1860 or the beginning of the century. And, you know, like looking at Rembrandt that went, you know, missing from one family because of a divorce and then they track who from the kids took the work and so on. And it's very fascinating to hear these very lengthy historical stories of like amazing pieces coming back to the market. So someone told me when I joined Christie's that the buyers of yesterday are the sellers of today and the buyers of today are the sellers of tomorrow. So we don't get rid of an artwork just the minute it sells. It's going to probably come back in the future and we will be requested at some po point in time to show uh, the data that we have, the provenance, traceability. Um, so I'm just going to skip about buyers and underbidders. So uh, the museums I talked about, there's a whole team and like in the last 10 years, it's been fascinating. Almost every big museum in Europe, in the States, had some collaboration in a way or another with the Christie's and other important auction houses because again of the, you know, the information that was needed. So our problematics is that as you probably all have witnessed if you dealt with Middle Eastern modern art and Iranian modern art is that it is poorly, poorly, poorly documented. And, but it's not like starting from zero. Sorry. Sorry, I'm a mess. Um, so basically, um, a lot of the publications were mainly government publications, in the, namely in the 50s and 60s in the Middle East. Uh, I don't know much about Iran, but these publications were either printed in very limited copies or a very small circulation, and they did not last, so a lot of them would just like uh, are not there anymore. We spent really a lot of time trying to get from old collectors, old generation artists, anything, even small leaflets, just to track if a work of art is mentioned, if a series is mentioned, and we, we read all the labels, we try to document you know, every little thing that is on any work of art, even sometimes on the frames, which are not as important, but so this is a lot of what we do. But to, give, uh, to paint a nicer picture after 12 years, like trying to internationalize this market, I feel that there are huge efforts that took place since the 90s. I remember reading the Dr. Nada's book, uh, much, much younger about Iraqi art, and, and I felt that, you know, like there was a lot of efforts trying to take this, uh, the art from the region to the West with, with serious approach and academia. Um, so basically, this is where I compare myself to, and I envy being a specialist working in the Impressionist department, 
because of the lack of catalog raisonné. So we are very proud because we were co-sponsoring uh, the first book on the first, uh, one of the most important modern Middle Eastern artists, Mahmoud Saeed, that was written, co-written by uh, Valerie Hess and Dr. Hossam Rashwan that we launched uh, two years ago at Christie's. And it took them six years to put together. And even so, um, this book did not start from scratch. Valerie based her research on an older book that was, that was printed in the, in the 90s and was poorly um, written. There was a lot of mistakes. So it was us in the office trying to fix all the mistakes in that book where we came with the idea of her focusing on, on this research and taking it further. So this is the first, but it's not the last. As I speak, there are so many books that came, not catalog raisonné, but monographs. Because Dr. Salwa is here, I can list the remember the um, Elias Zayad book, the monograph, just to name one, because we have the writer with us, but so many, so many initiatives are taking place. Uh, I know Rafia just behind you is working on something on Naim Smail and uh, a few other Syrian artists. So things are moving in the right direction. Um, I feel also a bit proud to be part of this whole market because yes, we are labeled to be like the people on the you know, commercial side and monetary side. But we did sell at Christie's alone above 3,500 works of art since 12 years. I don't know the exact number that Sotheby's and Bonhams also sold and like other smaller auction houses, local auction houses in Lebanon or in Morocco. But if you, we add all of this together, this is a big amount of data that is already cleared. Of course, there were a few uh, negative uh, you know, stories here and there, but they don't amount to 1%. So a lot of the young student, and I deal a lot with younger generation students coming to Dubai and wanting to learn, to learn more about Middle Eastern art, they use our catalogs in English as resources, which to my you know, like, surprise, they shouldn't. Because, again, because of the lack of publication, I've seen a few catalogs with one student in New York once with all these little post-it notes and trying to write his own story. Um, so there are, we are really helping many young people advancing and encouraging you know, people to become scholars. Um, we have invested heavily, I personally, with the, I push a lot to it, and we have a big library in our office in Dubai, which is open and accessible to anyone. I mean, of course, they just have to write to us and come in specific times. Uh, and now the office is going under a big refurbishment, so maybe starting from the beginning of next year. But we have books. We have bought, you know, a whole collections from artists, a lot of uh, periodic uh, periodicals. We have photocopies sometimes when we can't access the real book. And this is the aim to continue. Um, we love to offer a lot of valuation services, and I personally worked on many big, big, valuations in the region, uh, almost most of the museums in the region. And we do it for free for the sole purpose of, of course, you know, we are happy to serve and these are all important clients in the region, but also because the more we see, the more we learn, the more we can compare. Everybody in our world sadly thinks that they own uh, the masterpiece. And you have to see a lot of it, which is not documented, to tell them that your work is amazing, but it is not the masterpiece. Um, what else? Um, I mean, the world we're living in is amazing because we can, we, we all have cameras at hand, we all have, uh, we can tape, can interview, and um, I know that, you know, I'm working now with uh, an amazing junior specialist who's with us today, Mideast Art, who's done on her own a whole documentation on Khaliji artists. Uh, under her Fulbright. So Susie has developed a lot of interviews and taped all this older generation of GCC artists and some of them sadly passed away and she happens to be the only New Yorker who have a data of these artists. Um, what else? And through the last 12 years as well, we have advised so many artist estates, children of artists, to work in the right direction and to establish themselves as a state. Now, many times, the, the children of the artists are not the ones who are the most knowledgeable, but we accept that at least they're the ones who are custodians, who are guardians of a lot of the um, you know, sketches, the books, the, 
the photo albums of these artists, how they you know, documented their process. So 12 years ago, we did not have this relationship. And even though a lot of, uh, I mean, I just listed a few, but I can list uh, three more pages of these because for every piece of art, we try to identify uh, a board, uh, a group of people, a group of scholars, whether it's in Beirut, whether it's a group of Iraqi scholars, whether it's uh, you know, Syrian art connoisseur, we're trying uh, to form these links. Um, so basically now we also had the problem um, convincing clients and collectors to invest in these certificates of authenticity because it's not always, you know, they're like, I knew the artist, why should I pay his daughter 30 years later a certificate so she can document the work? And uh, Christy should pay the certificate. And it's like lengthy conversation that are really draining sometimes. But I feel that, you know, over these years, we, are, we have achieved something and it is going in the right direction. Um, what else I'm missing? So we started recognizing these people, thanking them in our catalogs. And um, a lot of them are offering a lot of the services for free so far, but many, many, many have started gaining, you know, asking for some fees because it's their time invested in looking into the archives and so on. So this is just like from the last uh, catalog of October, and I think this was the, the, the biggest uh, time we, you know, biggest list of people we thanked. So our aim, this is just like a small example of finding a work of art, trying to sell it, and then later on we discovered, you know, the work that was illustrated actually in a book, but we had the book in a, in a photocopy sent to us later on. So the aim is to have all these, uh, books or exhibitions or pictures in situ where we can just uh, formalize the authenticity of the work. And uh, I mean, to, I touched while speaking on the few problematics that uh, fakes are found all around the world, all around the world. Um, you know, with the recent political crisis, uh, these stories uh, are expected, obviously. But we are trying to, um, to limit this, and it's not all fake. This is the message I would like to, to mention. If there were a few issues, um, we'd rather withdraw the works, although it's causing a lot of follow-up and legal follow-up, but it's fine, it's healthy. I mean, this, these are things that are expected, and people should just speak to each other, not go on social media and just attack each other, which happened a few times, but then, you know, when we reach to the people, we explain to them what we do. We tell them that it's just two, three people doing this job. They usually calm down and then respect us in the process. Um, I uh, thank NYU Abu Dhabi, particularly, because I work with them a lot on providing, uh, you know, a lot of help. So thank you. If you have any questions, we're all here afterwards. Thank you. Thank you all. Very different, but all valuable and a lot of information for us to think about. And uh, thank you, Marjorie, for giving us the guidelines for museums. Uh, it's a very different look, but it's always, always important to know what are the professional guidelines and how museums acquire. And we are, we're not familiar yet with museum collection policies in this region, but we hope that these public institutions will be make such information available to the pub, to us at least in academia, so that our students and future professionals will be aware of this. So I thought that was an interesting aspect for us to look at and consider. And uh, Ro Roxanne, you, thank you also for focusing on the data collecting. I know it must have been a challenge. Uh, in the beginning, but I, I, I definitely knew you have all the answers. <laughs> um, and Hannah, you've done a great job of making the, uh, focusing on this region, particularly. 
Oh. It's me. Yeah. Oh, okay. So thank you, Hala, for your insightful and for uh, comments on the region. Uh, we all know how difficult it is to gather material, the bits and pieces from here and there, sort of. Uh, uh, so thank you. Uh, we have four minutes left uh, for this session, so I'm gonna open it up for questions. Is uh, Sophie there? Hello, uh, my name is Sophie Kazan. I, I, I write and I'm a researcher for art. Can you we, hear me? We, we can't hear the question. Okay. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Um, I was um, I, I, it, fascinating to learn how each, each of your different organizations collects data and um, different styles of data. I wondered if there is a form of uh, exchange or gathering of information which would mean that uh, that you could all benefit from, from all your different uh, data collection? The pooling of data, maybe? Uh, well, in, in a very short uh, sort of answer, and please, the other people will take it as well, data sharing is a real issue. We live in an age of data regulation, as you know, and there are strict controls about what can be shared, and especially where it relates to prices and hard data and that kind of thing. So data sharing will always be a problematic, but please, others can answer as well. Hello. In the nonprofit sector, um, data is shared very readily. And uh, some of the studies that I was talking about, about visitors and how visitors engage with art, that data is regularly published. But that's, again, because museums are public sector organizations. Yeah, I agree with uh, what Roxanne has said. But having said that, because a lot of the times, a lot of conversations are not happening uh, very formally, we do end up you know, asking some questions for people. And it's so we, I mean, I do take a lot of, um, I do ask the legal department every single time just to, to save myself, but I ask them that I need to ask this person because he's been, I saw on social media, he's been to this artist and I just need to know if they have the book or not and, and so on. So I think if it's done in a good faith about something that will just make the life of everybody easier, then I think there's a little bit of Sharing. Yeah, I think one of the challenges we face in this region is that there isn't an independent institution for pooling data or that follows the data. So we understand that commercial entities are not forthcoming, why they're not forthcoming, of course, or transparent about their data, that's obvious. But having another independent institution that could uh, follow the trends and give the collectors and uh, scholars and others and I, I, you know, some kind of uh, uh, data that they can work with. So that would be very helpful. I mean, this morning, uh, Professor Stefano gave examples of his own research. Uh, we don't have enough art historians in the regions who are studying also the art market. They, they are, th that would be another very important source to contribute to the data uh, pr you know, collection that you mentioned. Possibly. Any other questions? Hi, uh, thank you for the great talks. I'm Ken San Lee, the one of the faculty member here in NYU Abu Dhabi. I have a two question, one for Roxanne and one for Marjorie. So as a computational social scientist who, who analyze art market with the machine learning techniques, so I'd like to hear a little bit more about how the SODAB is using the machine learning that you Kind of sleep at the last. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Okay. I'll just talk with the microphone. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So I'm Kang San, NYU Abu Dhabi faculty member, and I'm the one who actually analyzed art market data with the machine learnings and computational state. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about how Sotheby is trying to use the machine learning to understand the client a little bit more. And for Marjorie, uh, I have another question. So do you see any changes before and after the economic crisis about the collection policies that the public museums are having? So that's my question. Um, in response to your uh, question about machine learning, obviously, for those who don't know, machine learning, and I'm going to read you the definition of machine learning, 
It's the science of getting computers to learn and act like humans do and improve their learning over time to autonomously fashion, um, sorry, function by feeding um, that data uh, into information and being able to use it. I mean, this is obviously machine learning is something new. It's a work in progress to actually tell you the exact mechanism of how we do it is not within my possibilities. But like firms like, say, Pinterest, we would like to use machine learning as what we call sort of um, taste fingerprints. We want to form taste fingerprints of our clients to understand better what it is they like and they want. And I have to be clear that I think the reason why our three presentations have appeared so different is that we've addressed different aspects of what data is. I mean, I didn't go into the business of defining what we mean by data, but what I meant by data was hard data, prices, estimates, client information. Hala looked at much more comprehensive way of how data is compiled and what they look at as a company. And of course, you have been focused on the museum uh, perspective. So uh, in terms of my part of the machine learning. It's something that's a work in progress, even blockchain, you know, that sort of approach. We have also just acquired Thread Genius, which is sort of like a visual version, if you like, of Spotify. Uh, there are lots of different new initiatives afoot to um, make our uh, sort of industry more and more attuned to the client's needs. I know that we are running very short on time, so the short answer to your question of have there, has there been changes in collections practices in museums since the economic downturn? Yes, and we can talk about it at the break in the hall. Okay, thank you all very much, and uh, thank you, Ms. Speakers. It's been very interesting, amazing, and challenging, I know, <laughs> because we're still working on it. We all are, aren't we?